China rams a Filipino fishing boat, and you won't believe how Duterte responded. Or maybe you will. Huawei employees have been secretly working with China's military. What a surprise. And Trump and Xi will meet at the G20. What will they talk about? Probably chocolate cake. Hi, welcome to China Uncensored. I'm Chris Chappell. I'm Charlie Zhang. So we're here in Hong Kong uh, covering the protests. However, we figured it's probably pretty important that we cover some of the other China news going on out there. So we're going to do sort of an off-the-cuff uh, rundown of some of the biggest China news stories that have been happening. Shelley, why don't you lead us off with the top one? Okay, so uh, two weeks ago, a Chinese boat rammed a Filipino fishing boat in the South China Sea. So it was in this area called Reed Bank, which falls in the Philippines' exclusive economic zone. So, so that's uh, pretty close to actual Filipino territory. This is not disputed waters. Exclusive economic zones are about 200 nautical miles outside of mm -hmm. the actual land of the Philippines. So uh, yeah, it's still, I think, within some area where the Chinese um, obviously have these vessels in the area that are fishing boats. AKA, Your quotation marks were very low. She made quotation marks. Uh, they're fishing boats and they fishing are uh, part of what's called the, uh, you know, China's maritime militia. And if you'd like us to do a video on that in the future, please let us know in the comments below. It's pretty interesting. Um, but anyway, so 22 fishermen were thrown into the water and then the Chinese boat kind of fled the scene, uh, but luckily the fishermen were rescued by a boat from Vietnam. Good. Now the interesting thing about this is how Duterte has kind of downplayed it. Uh, he called it, uh, he just called it a maritime incident. Uh, these are not ironic quotation marks. This no, time. These, are, the, these are actual quotation marks. He actually said a maritime incident. A maritime yes. incident, and there was no confrontation. People have gotten so upset about this, like there's talk about actually trying to impeach Duterte. Uh, sort of based on the idea that like part of his duty is to protect the uh, like territorial integrity of mm -hmm. the Philippines, and now people are kind of saying, well, you're not doing that. Duterte had a very interesting response to that, though, Shelley. I think the headline here says, impeach me, I'll put you all in jail. Uh, Duterte also said uh, that, you know, China could fish in the Philippines' exclusive economic zone, uh, because China and the Philippines are friends. Uh, uh, I got a little taken out of context in some of the media where it seemed like, oh, he was giving China permission because we're all friends here. But actually what he meant was he didn't think China would fish in the exclusive economic zone yeah. because they're friends. Yeah, the full quote is, I don't think that China would do that. Why? Because we're friends. So yeah, you know, China would never do anything bad to their friends. That is the issue that a lot of uh, smaller countries feel with dealing with China is that, you know, we're a small country. What can we do to China? If we tell them not to do this, they'll just laugh and do it anyway. Well, one last thing, though, is that, you know, after he said this and became very controversial, then his spokesman came out and said that, no, 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 the president will not relinquish the Filipino Philippine sovereign rights over our country's exclusive economic zone. So just to clarify, that's not what he said. It's nice when the president needs a spokesman. The other big story is in the U.S. the Democratic debates are happening, and one thing that has come up a lot is the threat China is to the U.S. So there was a question, there are two nights of Democratic debates, ten people because a night. Because there's so many candidates. Oh God, it's like uh, nobody gets voted off the island after these, they keep going. But anyway, the, the first night there were the candidates, I almost said contestants, were asked what America's greatest geopolitical threat was, and four out of ten said China in some capacity. If these are contestants and not candidates, is that, does that mean there's going to be a swimsuit competition? I sincerely hope not. <laughs> I don't know, Andrew Yang. And then on the second night, there was, again, a couple of questions about China. Okay, so Mayor Pete Buttigieg got that right. Uh, said that we have to recognize the China challenge as a serious one and that China is using technology for the perfection of dictatorship. Um, Senator Michael Bennett said the president's been right to push back on China, but he's done it the wrong way. Similar with Andrew Yang, who said, acknowledges that China is an economic threat, but says that the tariffs are not the right way to go. So, you know, ultimately, it's a democratic debate. They're going to talk a lot about U.S. domestic issues, mm -hmm. uh, but China is 
shaping up to be one of the things that's going to be big in this election. And what's interesting is like it's clear at this point to everyone that China is a bipartisan issue. So they, they have the challenge of saying, yes, we agree with Trump that China is an issue, but he is totally wrong on everything how he's doing with it. That's why we have to be voted in. Well, the interesting thing is that when you've got 10 candidates on a stage, none of them actually said what they would do about China. Like a couple of them said that they wanted to reset the U.S.-China relationship, but uh, what does that mean? Yeah. Unclear. And, okay. uh, and then there's the whole issue of Biden and his family's questionable ties. That's a story for another time. Um, so, in moving other news, on. Moving yes. on. In other news, uh, pro Beijing forces in Taiwan have actually been acting up. That was a big deal in the recent elections in Taiwan that the Chinese Communist Party was doing a lot of uh, things to sort of promote candidates that were more in line with uh, the Beijing's agenda. Um, yeah, now there's been a foreign policy piece that's kind of gone into that, which is pretty interesting. Um, maybe we'll do an episode about that later. Yeah. Uh, Meanwhile, tens of thousands of people in Taipei stood in the rain for four hours, uh, that was Tuesday, I believe, uh, calling for a ban on pro-CCP media outlets in Taiwan. And that's a big way the Chinese Communist Party's sort of united front works in countries around the world, as they buy Chinese language media or invest in certain ways, and then that sort of subverts the message. Yeah, it's interesting because there's been such a big pushback against these, what they call in Chinese, red media. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I don't think this, this uh, parade, this protest was scheduled before the Hong Kong protest started happening, but there was definitely kind of increased turnout because of what's happening in Hong Kong yeah. and probably a greater fear among Taiwanese people. Yeah, it definitely of changed here. the dynamic of it. And, and one of those pro-Beijing groups, I think there was a quote from one who said, our God is China, which is... That's totally normal and not, you know, worrying at all. That God demands human sacrifice. Organs. It's the same thing. The Chinese Communist Party is like the Aztec religion. It's all about ripping like out people's hearts. Uh, moving on, uh, you know, how do Chinese people feel about pork products? Shall um... We? Honestly, I think that if you were to lose all pork products in China, that might cause the downfall of the Chinese Communist Party. So, it's a bad news that the African swine fever is devastating pigs in China. Uh, it's really putting them on the spit. Uh, <laughs> or, or the opposite, since uh, you don't want to eat those. Yes, yes, yes. yes. <laughs> yeah, so, so uh, there are official figures that something like 25% of the of the the pig population is being culled inside mainland yeah, China. Yeah, it's, it's very bad. It's uh, like bird flu, but but I you know we've also read more. that the actual figures are much higher than that. Because when do they ever report accurate figures in the Chinese media? Yeah, very very uh, bad situation. Nevertheless, despite how bad the pig situation is, China's actually banned meat imports from Canada as part of their you know, general not liking the Canadian very much. Well, anymore. there was a banned meat additive that was found in one shipment of Canadian meat. And so, of course, that is very dangerous, and they mm -hmm. need to ban all meat shipments from Canada. The Chinese Communist Party is very big on food safety, as you all know. So then uh, the interesting twist to this story is that now Canada is looking into suspected foul play regarding the origins of that bad meat. Foul play? Oh, not that. I thought we were talking about pig. Oh, no. If it wasn't clear what I was going for. Yeah, no, I think it was, I think it was pretty clear. Yeah. But anyway, so they're, they're saying that it looks like some of the, uh, you know, customs documents are forged in that shipment and maybe it didn't actually come from Canada. So mm. more to come on this breaking A story. A real pig-headed conspiracy. Moving All right. on. Moving on. Moving on. Uh, more interesting developments with Huawei. According to Bloomberg, Huawei employees have been working with the Chinese military on research projects. Here's my shocked face. I am shocked. Yes. I thought it was a private in, a private company with no Owned company. by employees. Owned by employees. Now, to be fair to Huawei, uh, the way Bloomberg discovered this is they did some research into publicly uh, available, uh, so they did some research in publicly disclosed studies. And in these studies, they said there was evidence of Huawei employees, not the company itself, but just individual employees, 
doing research with the Chinese military, kind of things like artificial intelligence or radio communication. I mean, maybe Huawei had no idea that their well, employees were doing Huawei this. Well, that's what Huawei is saying. Like, okay. no, we had, no, we had no idea this was going on. I mean, and sort of Bloomberg's thing is saying, like, you know, we, we, we know this is happening from just the very few uh, publicly disclosed studies that are actually available. Most of these military studies are, you know, never make it to the public, never make it online. Uh, so this could be a much bigger thing than Huawei says is absolutely not a thing. Well, I mean, the whole thing about China talking about civil-military fusion, right, that we've done yes. a few episodes about. Uh, so a lot of these are kind of technologies that could be used in non-military applications, but also are used in military applications. Mm -hmm. And so this is entrapping a lot of uh, Western tech companies like Microsoft, Google, they've all been doing research with Chinese military universities who then are probably using this same kind of technology like AI yeah. facial recognition in like Xinjiang to help wipe out an ethnicity, so. I mean, there was also Australian universities that had that same issue yeah, as well. Yeah, it's happening so, all over the world. Yeah, so research projects with China, yeah. maybe if some China asks you, the Chinese military asks you to work on its research project, you don't want to do that, yeah. This is the sad thing, because you, you keep hearing more about how China's building like this techno-authoritarian dystopian society, and it's not like they're coming up with this themselves. They're getting this technology from Western tech companies. So these Western tech companies are sort of involved in creating a system that is trying to replace freedom and democracy. It's a terrible thing. Cisco. <laughs> okay, moving on. Moving on. Uh, well, still more with Huawei. So um, the Trump administration has put a ban on U.S. tech companies selling a lot of uh, technology to Huawei. Uh, however, some U.S. companies have found loopholes to still supply Huawei despite the export ban. Uh, and this this first came out in a, in the Wall Street Journal. Uh, so basically, there's like this loophole to the export ban that if Foreign-made products include no more than 25% U.S. content, then they're able to kind of get it in. Uh, now, the, the nice thing is, uh, according to uh, Kevin Wolf, a former U.S. Assistant Secretary of Commerce for the Export Administration, uh, the Commerce Department could fix this pretty yeah, easily. Yeah, yeah, basically, without and it doesn't even need to go through Congress for approval. So this is a loophole that's pretty easy to close. But it just shocks me that like. As, like, it's so transparent, like, the reality of Huawei, of how it's very, very tied to the Chinese Communist Party, and yet U.S. tech companies are still like, oh, gosh, is there any way we can do business with them? Uh, other Huawei news. Uh, Huawei actually has sued a U.S. company, CNEX, or C-N-E-X. I'm going to go with CNEX. Um, Sounds saying cooler. Saying that they stole... Uh, Huawei intellectual property, uh, but a U.S. jury ruled uh, that the semiconductor company CNEX uh, did not do that. Um, CNEX also filed a countersuit against Huawei, saying that they it was them trying to steal their technology, um, and the jury did find that uh, Huawei did misappropriate their secrets, but didn't award them any damages. And in our final story for the day, uh, the G20 is about to start. I know. You're all excited. You've been waiting for that. I mean, who doesn't love geopolitical summits? Uh, well, these are technically an economic summit. Geo-economic political? Mm. Oh, whatever. All right. Um, so the big news is, like, everyone wondering what's going to happen with the trade war. Uh, U.S.-China so, trade war. The U.S.-China trade war. Uh, so far, uh, President Trump has held off on doing new tariffs. However, he has said that is on the table if a trade agreement can't be reached. According to Trump's schedule, he's meeting with Xi Jinping on Saturday, the second day of the G20, for 90 minutes. So everybody's kind of wondering what's going to happen uh, with, with that meeting. Um, meanwhile, um, Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin has said that uh, he got the markets a little excited by saying that the U.S. and China were about 90 percent of the way to a trade deal before it became a no deal. And then he says that he thinks that there's a path to complete the trade deal. He is a China optimist. He is a, uh, you know, what is the path? We're not sure. Yeah, I think you, you read a funny tweet about that. Oh, that like uh, there was somebody who tweeted about, you know, I am, you know, 90% of the way to uh, going to the gym. I've bought all my clothes. I've bought all the weights. I've All I have to do is exercise, and then I will lose weight. So. Yeah. Yeah. 
So that's kind of what the 90% means is it got almost all the way there until they actually deleted all the enforcement mechanisms, which meant that it meant nothing anymore. Oh, that, that was the last time. Yeah. Um, so. Yeah, we'll keep you updated with things on the G20, and obviously stay tuned for uh, all of our Hong Kong coverage since we're here. Uh, we're expecting July 1st to be a pretty big uh, day. July 1st is obviously the anniversary of when uh, the UK gave Hong Kong to China. So it's like a unindependence day. Exactly. Yeah. Unindependence day. And, you know, uh, in our last video, if you haven't seen it, we talked about how Hong Kong protesters were protesting to all these countries ahead of the G20. Uh, they are buying ads, newspapers, like ads came out in 10 different newspapers. And trying to get these countries to yeah. actually bring up Hong Kong yes. situation. So the, the ads say, G20, save Hong Kong, you know. So they're really looking for some quality foreign interference. Um, and that's pretty embarrassing, especially after the Chinese authorities said that nobody was allowed to talk about Hong Kong at the G20. So, I'm sure they're going to listen to yeah. Xi Jinping. Speaking of, hey, Chris. Yeah? Uh, what's that, Shelly? What's that, Shelly? <laughs> Do you know who brought up the Hong Kong at the G20 already? Who? Um, everybody's favorite Japanese prime minister. Shinzo Abe? Yes. So. Ooh. Uh, Shinzo Abe has already talked about Hong Kong with Xi Jinping. Uh, he has stressed the importance of a free and open Hong Kong under one country, two systems, in light of the extradition bill. And he also mentioned uh, the importance of the human rights situation in Xinjiang with the Uyghurs. Well, if the Chinese Communist Party didn't already hate Japan, I'm sure they do now. All right, so I think we're going to sign off for now. Uh, stay tuned for more, and let us know what you think of this kind of a format for our headlines. Uh, thanks for watching. Once again, I'm Chris Chaplin. I'm Shelley Zhang. And don't forget to support the show on Patreon. Visit patreon.com slash China Uncensored to find out how you can support the show and get some cool perks as well. Talk to you next time. Bye.